Welcome everyone to Gabby About Gardening. Welcome Mark Dahl. Mark is a dedicated, super enthusiastic, dare I say, um, maybe uh, obsessive soil health guy who lives on 40 acres on Quadra Island. Mark has been self-studying, but also studying with um, Elaine Ingham and other teachers, I'm sure he'll tell us who they are. Uh, he's been studying soil for several years. I've learned so much from Mark. And today, as our guest presenter and garden teacher, Mark is speaking to us about soil health and fertility. So I'm going to turn it over to you now, Mark. Thank you again for joining us. All right. Hi, everybody, um, and welcome. Uh, yesterday, I think uh, Lou asked me to start with a little bit about the farm. So that was a fun piece of information. So I quickly whipped up just a, a brief overview of what we're doing here on the farm and who we are uh, on, here at Foot Forward. So we'll take a look at that. And then after those, I think I have 10 quick slides there, then we'll jump into today's topic, which is soil. So on the soil front, what I thought we would do today is I've been, Lou and I have had several conversations on gathering about gardening and on Cortez Radio, and we seem to jump from one topic to the other. And so what I was thinking today is we kind of go back and get our foundations put in place. So when we're talking about compost, why is compost a good thing? When we're talking about mulch, why, why do we mulch? What's the reasons behind what we're doing? And so we'll take a look at what's happening in the soil that makes all these things that we've talked about and that Lou's talked about and all the guests on this, this channel have talked about, what makes that uh, uh, those strategies work? And can get a little complex. I'll try and keep it as simple as I can. Um, Every day I learn something new about soil. And what's kind of cool is, is I think we're the science of soil is progressing faster than any other um, area of science. I think every day there's something that our, our understanding in the last 20 years, our understanding of soil has been completely turned on its head. And even in the last two years, um, since I you know thought I had a really good comprehension. There's been things that have come out uh, in the last two years that again have never dawned on 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 science. So the one last week that kind of you know jumped out at me is that most plants and actually almost every single plant is actually a carnivore. Um, every plant eats is taking bacteria and sucking its protoplasm and cytoplasm out within the plant cell, and it actually is farming. Um, bacterium and is actually so we are even our plants are in some way carnivoristic which is which was mind-boggling to me I, and that that information is only that's only three years old uh, in terms of information so anyways so that was really cool to learn so what we thought would start i'll just jump into the share screen mode here and we will go for a quick little view of where we are oh, oops wrong button okay come on this button I might have my wife to save me again here. What happened here? Uh, I want to go to, oh, here we go. Am I sharing my screen? I think so. So let's go here. And no, not, nothing yet, but take your time. How about now? I'm showing that I'm sharing this. Is it not sharing with you? It's not showing up on my screen. How about everybody else? Are you guys seeing anything? Are you seeing me still or a blank screen? Um, blank screen for you, Mark. All right, I'm gonna hit stop share. I'm gonna hit the back to the share button. I'm gonna share application. I'm gonna share this button, hit share. And it shows me I'm Yay! sharing. Yay, you did it. Okay, and then hit present. Okay, so we've called our farm uh, Foot Forward Forest Farm. Um, the foot forward part is about we we're looking for something positive um, and we wanted uh, you know to, to say that we're always putting our best foot forward here even if sometimes it's not the best foot forward because a lot of mistakes happen here and that we're still maintaining a large part of our farm as forests as we'll take a look at in the middle in a minute. So here's the team 
Um, so we have myself, my wife, Jennifer, our twin daughters, Gabrielle and Charlotte. Uh, we have some visitors in the Scream Skokie, uh, Scotia Dog down below. Um, I think that was, can't remember the name of that particular goat. Um, and a couple of chicks. And, and so we had, uh, those are the, the people uh, on the team. Where we're located is on uh, Quadra Island. If you know, I'm not sure, I think everybody here is probably from the region, but uh, the, the ferry uh, leaves here and goes right there. And if you to drive off the ferry, and if you could imagine, um, take a, never turn your steering wheel, you would hit the back part of the farm, which is right here. We were kind of equidistant from both coasts on Quadra and right at the height of the island, which puts us in a weird climactic zone. We lose a grow zone because we're at about 300 feet above sea level and we don't get as much ocean effect as others. So when you're down over here, I have a friend who lives down here and he's got palm trees growing on his property and that wouldn't happen on, on ours. We have frost much later in the year and much earlier in the year than the rest of the island. I think uh, Lou, we're probably more comparable. I think probably even Bold Point would be a little bit warmer in the shoulder seasons than we are, but we're probably hotter than anywhere on the island in the height of summer. So we get a lot of heat units. So it's a really interesting uh, grow zone. I didn't anticipate it when we bought the farm, but that's what we have and we make some adjustments. So there's some things I thought we could grow, which we can't, but some things that we couldn't, I didn't think we could grow, we can. So here's the farm itself. Uh, the house is down here in the corner. We access the driveway through here, house is here, garage, some barns. This is our greenhouse down here, all our gardens. Um, we've built by hand in the front of the house here. And then now we've extended all the way out in front of the greenhouse. So we've got probably in terms of what we could potentially put to garden in a year, we have about three quarters of an acre in terms of intensely gardened uh, we have uh, orchards back in this area. I have a food forest that I started back over here. Um, we, the rest of it is, is different levels of pasture. So where we're bringing our, mostly the sheep, I do what's called um, managed intensive grazing. So my sheep will never have access to more than, you know, probably an eighth to a quarter of an acre of this property at ever, any one time. And I cycle them through the property based on where it's appropriate for them to be. Um, so we can, we can talk about that later on, but it's, it's, it is a soil building, carbon sequestrating uh, method of grazing uh, ruminants based on the buffalo. And it's how grass was designed, how it evolved over millions of years or billions of years. And so what we implement here on the farm. So many farms would just say, okay, I have 40 acres. I put a fence around it and I go let my animals eat and I calculate how much food is out there and that's how many head we have. We have to do it quite a bit differently. Um, this strip right here was a airstrip and so the topsoil was stripped off of this area and it grows terribly. So when we got, I say when we got the farm, it was a atrocious pasture. We went from atrocious to terrible and a terrible to poor. So I think we're currently at poor now after uh, three growing seasons and we're hoping to get to good within a year. Um, but it's got a long way to come. We're only looking at four to six inches of growing medium uh, on this field, uh, which makes, makes uh, farming it and grazing on it very difficult. And this is, uh, we do permaculture design. So this would be our zone five. This is our, our forest. It's a third growth forest. It's in pretty poor condition. Um, but it's a zone that feeds the farm with lots of energies and we don't, uh, we won't harvest that in the, in the ways that a lot of people uh, harvest like clear cutting and whatnot. So anyways, that's the farm. Uh, here are our hardest working uh, members of our team. <coughs> so we have the sheep where we, they are bringing the pastures back to life. Uh, sheep are amazing animals. They just get up and they go to work every day and that's all they do is work. Uh, they are, they're currently my favorite uh, um, animals that we have here on the farm. Uh, other hardworking animals, we have pigs. If you can take a look at the amount of um, disturbance, and we'll talk about disturbance in the soil presentation uh, that they can create in this little zone. They're, they're heading out to the forest to take an area that is, was kind of a, an overgrown forest. We've cleared it out and they're gonna turn it into something called silvopasture which is the 
best carbon sequestrating uh, method of, uh, of grazing animals. So they're going to take an old choked out forest and part of what their job is is going to be turning it into a pasture. Um, this is uh, some chickens that are currently in what we call a chicken moat around the garden. So there's the house, the greenhouse, and all this in front of the house here is all garden area. And they are on three sides of this garden. So any slug that wants to get into our garden has to make it through a gauntlet of chickens. Uh, this is our mobile coop, which is about to head out from here. And we're gonna put them out into the compost area here for the summer very shortly. Other hard workers, we have geese. A lot of people don't like geese. I quite love them because I've discovered they eat buttercup and they actually go down and eat the roots of the buttercup. So they're quite awesome. And our goats are actually our geese and our ducks are what keeps our homemaker uh, mode. We don't ever mow the lawn. We use our geese and our ducks. And if it gets a little bit out of control, we'll bring the sheep in uh, to control any um, of the grass to make it, you know, it's not a, we don't have a golf course lawn but we have a growing, uh, very fertile, it's just getting greener and, and more lush by the year by using the animals again in a, in a type of rotation. And then there's goats <clears throat> and well, at least they're cute. Uh, I, goats uh, have done their job on the farm. They're, they're not um, an animal that works well with my grazing systems. So keeping them contained has been a bit of a trial. So they kind of have free range on the farm but they have done amazing work in, in knocking down the fire hazards and, and clearing out things underneath trees. And they are ridiculous cute. And, and we do get a lot of milk with them and I make cheese and whatnot. So we, we still quite like our goats, but they don't, uh, they don't fit into the farm as well as they did in the first couple of years. Here's a picture from the roof of the house, just looking at the gardens. Uh, this is Jen's area. Um, and greenhouse and then out there is I kind of do potatoes and corn and mango wurzels and uh, different grains out in the in the far area and uh, the last stage so this is my compost tea brewer we'll talk a little bit of that in the soil world um, so that is one of the ways that we bring fertility uh, to uh, the uh, farm is taking a little bit of compost and turning it into the equivalent of several tons of compost through what's called actively aerated compost tea. So you can see this water in here is just boiling away because we have an air compressor that's blowing air through a, a tea bag of compost and various foods in there that I use. So that is the farm and stop share. How do we do there, Lou? Okay, the, any questions? If there's no questions, Questions, I'll jump right into um, the soil presentation. I, I loved it. I love seeing those pictures, even though I've seen it. I love seeing the, the view from above. And I didn't realize that about your, your micro zone, that you're, you're cooler than the surrounding area. That's interesting. Is that because you're at the highest point up? Yeah, we don't, I think, it's a combination of altitude, but it's, I mean, it's 300 and about, about 300 feet even on the farm. We're very flat. We've got like four feet of drop from one end of the property to the other. So that's, it's, oh. it's, yeah, that it's is tough. that. And just one more question. You know, I should know this, I, I think, but I don't. Um, you referred to zone five in the permaculture zone. Can you just say what that is and, and speak? really briefly about how the zones in permaculture work? So permaculture, you have zone one through five or zero through five, zero is your actual home. Um, it's based on how often you tend that area. So zone zero, you're in, you're living and you're breathing in it. Your zone one is your garden right outside your house. So if you notice our garden, uh, Jen commented on the other day, I think she went out and got her herbs in her slippers. Um, and that's the, the concept is you want anything, if you, the, was it, um, I can't remember which permaculturalist said, if you have to get your, uh, your feet wet when you're getting your herbs, you got them too far away from the house. Um, zone one is your garden that you're gonna tend daily. Your zone two is kind of your berry bushes into a zone three, things you go to you know weekly. Your zone three and four, that's my grazing um, areas and my, uh, areas of the farm that I only visit maybe once every few weeks and zone five is your wild and, and it's important to maintain a lot of farms just clear every tree off of it and flatten everything 
but the energies and the things that come out of that forest, um, the grass that greens quickest on the forest, on the farm is that which is in a mycorrhizal association with trees. And so in the spring, it's really outstanding. You see these edge zones this is coming out of zone five where your most alive parts of the farm, especially in the early spring, are things that are, are attached directly to the forest. Excellent. Thank you so much. I made note of that. I, I appreciate it. Okay, um, we have several more people join us. We're up to 40 people, Mark. Again, welcome to Gabbing About Gardening. Mark Dahl is our guest presenter and garden teacher today. Mark is sharing his knowledge in relation to soil health and fertility. I'll turn it back over to you again, Mark. Okay, so uh, the farm tour uh, completed. We'll jump into um, the actual presentation on soil. So soil presentation and view and present. Okay, now I, I don't like just talking with um, just a, uh, a screen behind me. It would be fun if, a, if this program had that ability to have my corner, my, my face there so I can, I feel like I'm just talking to when I'm talking at these slides. So I might jump in and out and I'll see how clumsy that feels. But today's uh, top, we're gonna call it about understanding soil. Like I said here at the beginning, we've talked about some of the little elements in great detail over the last number of months with Lou. And so some of them require a little bit deeper knowledge um, to understand why we do them. So my goal here today is to touch on all the different elements that make all of our other conversations that we may potentially have in the future, that we've got the language down so that we can talk about them with comfort um, and, and, a, and a proficiency. So what do we need to understand to get to that point? We need to understand what is soil? What makes soil soil? What is soil? How is soil different from, from dirt? And we're gonna find out that that what is actually a who. And we're gonna find out who's who in the zoo. What's, what's in, the, in, in our feet? We're gonna understand how that system works, who runs that system. We'll take some time and look at the heroes and the villains in the soil. We'll look at the different types of soil. So all, are all soils the same? Well, we'll cheat a little bit and say, no, they're not, but we're gonna look at what makes the difference in, those, in the different types of soil. And we'll give you the, I was gonna start with this slide, but then I figured if I started with the slide, everybody would tune out of the conversation because there is a secret to Everything else, even if you understand nothing else, once we get to the secret to a healthy, productive garden, you don't actually have to understand anything I say before that. If you can remember this, that one slide, um, everything else is kind of moot. And then we'll take a look at what are some basic principles to keep your healthy garden soil. And in fact, it's not just garden, it's the same principles I um, put to my pastures. So what is soil? And I put it, soil is not simply a repository of nutrients and water soluble minerals, because that is what I was taught. Um, my whole life until about maybe six or seven years ago, my understanding of soil was a place where there were nutrients and ions and plants sucked up those ions through their roots and that's what made them grow. That is exactly how plants feed themselves to a tune of 1% of their entire, um, what's the word I'm looking at, their entire energies comes from that way of feeding themselves that 1% of just sucking it up like a straw. But what makes soil soil is not that it's full of nutrients and full of minerals and full of all of that, but it's that it is alive. That is what makes soil soil. Soil is a community of life. It is the Serengeti of predator and prey. And that is what feeds our plants. Here are some of our friends in the soil. So these, um, when I do that compost tea, that last slide in the farm, I take time and I look at each batch under the microscope to see what's in there because I need to be assured that I'm, I have the heroes and I don't have villains. I don't wanna be selling people villains. And the fun thing is under a microscope, this is all these slides are all done at 400 times on a compound microscope. And you can buy a compound microscope for as little as like 150 bucks. 
Um, and this is, whoopsie, let's go backwards. This is what you see under in a slide uh, under those microscopes. And it's absolutely fascinating. So we'll take a look at this little piece over here. If you can follow my arrow uh, on the left-hand picture, there's a little brown ladder. That is fung a fungal hyphae. That's the roots of mushrooms. And when I see something like this, that dark brown color, and this is about, ooh, that's like eight microns wide. A micron is, see this little dot here? That's a bacterium. A bacterium is one micron. So how many microns, how many bacteria go across that? About seven or eight. Dark brown, segmented like a ladder. That is a good guy fungus. And you get very excited when you see that. When we get into the different types of soil, you'll understand when I, why when I see this, I get like super happy. This big guy right over here is a super duper big good friend of your soil. This is a nematode. And often people, when they hear the word nematode, they panic because you can buy all these anti-nematode um, uh, poisons that kill all the nematodes in your soil. And they do kill all the nematodes in your soil, including these guys. And these guys in a good soil if, if, are the best thing in your soil. This is a bacterial feeding nematode. You can tell by his lips. If you look over here, he's got big lips. And that is the sign of a bacterial feeding nematode. And he goes around and he's just going to devour all these little bacteria, put it into his crop. And he's got a crop just like a chicken and squishes all the cytoplasmy goodness out of it. And that ends up coming out the other end into the soil. And that is plant food. So a bacteria goes in the soil and eats up and gets minerals and builds its cytoplasm and its cell wall, but is completely unavailable to your plants. You need these guys to make it available to your plants. This is another super fun guy in your soil. If you can see this uh, up in the top, in the middle top uh, picture, this is an amoeba. An amoeba, you think back to your grade nine science, that was in a pond or you, know, you think of that in a water system. But soils are water systems. Every, every particle of soil is covered in a micron or two of water in which all of the life exists. And this is another bacterial feeder. He's going around eating up bacterial and the same thing. Uh, his ex he's exiting or what, he's, what exits its body is plant food. This big guy here is a microarthropod and he's going to eat these guys. And when he eats these guys, he makes it completely plant available. And oops. So just to give you a sense of what I see in a microscope, I thought we'd take a look at um, a video just for fun. And this is what you see. Let's go see if we can go to full screen. This is what it looks like. This is actually um, a higher magnification than I use. This is a thousand magnification. So all to me, these little, these, I could tell these are like this guy, here's a rod bacteria. These are mostly rods and you got some round bacteria, but every different shape of bacterium is a different bacterium in and of itself. And um, you got spirally ones, you got rod ones, this is like an actinobacteria over here. And they all, they're alive, they're moving. This is soil, soil, soil is alive and, and functioning and interacting. And, and we just don't understand that this is the bulk of our soil. Here, we've got some uh, up here, uh, you can see them popping down a little bit. This is an amoeba eating bacteria with all these fungal strands. These fungal strands are not making me super happy, but what's interesting is taking a look at all the interaction between bacteria and fungus on these particular fungal strands, which is just super neat. Um, there's that, there, here's where that uh, the amoeba is coming down and you can see him actually consume, there, he just sucked in some bacteria. And uh, one of my favorite things that I, I, I got to see an amoeba poop um, last year, and it was just like sitting there and it pooped and the poop went that way and the amoeba went that way. It was, it was like in space. It was really a, a, an amazing thing to see. So there's just some of the, um, uh, oh, I actually have to turn that off because if I don't turn that off, it's gonna talk to me and I can't move this thing to turn it off. Uh-oh, let me go here. Let's see, I gotta turn this off somehow because it's going to, why is it, this thing's in the wrong spot? Okay, well, that's not going to work. I'm working on it. I can't see the tab. My wife is talking to me, so just close the tab. Well, I would, except for this little thing is covering where the tab is. Maybe if I drop, get that out. 
where I can get to that. Uh, oh, no. See how this, I'm just a little technical. See how that's over top of the tab? I can't get to the tab. Um, we'll just go back. But we're having fun watching. You don't have to worry about us. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna try, because the thing is at the end of it, uh, somebody starts talking. So that's gonna be in there. Uh, mm. There's where the talking starts. Okay, so can I get here and unpin close? Yay, okay, there it is. Okay, perfect. Okay. okay. That, was, that was fabulous, Mark. And that was really fun. It's it's so weird. Like at least when you go on to the presentation, I can see your faces. I can tell if I'm not putting you all to sleep or not, but I am <laughs> staring at my- Haven't anybody fall asleep yet. You're doing good. <laughs> All right, so uh, back to the soil presentation. Let's go back to this and, okay, so here's our who's who in the zoo. So the soil is the cycle of life and death. It is an absolute, like I said before, a Serengeti. It is a constant predator and prey interaction um, within the soil that's making things that are not plant available are making them plant available. If you have only bacteria in your soil, you have nothing interacting with your plants. And this is the scary thing is our use of fertilizers, our use of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides has created this, has taken a Serengeti, a wild African cornucopia of life and turned it into a desert of bacteria. So most of the corn soy fields that we see in, in across the entire continent aren't growing on soil anymore. This does not apply. There are but bacteria. And in fact, um, on this property, when I first started taking slides of the soil in this property, it was bacteria. And still in a lot of portions, it's still mainly bacterial. And um, you know, I'm fighting a hydrology problem that's killing a lot of my life over the winter, but um, it's coming along, I'm seeing more signs of life, but that's, this is what we've done through compaction, through all, through the use of chemicals is taken soil and created a desert of just a dearth of life. So what happens is plants interact with all of these different critters in different ways that that's what feeds them. Plants know that that's what, that's what this is the hand that feeds them. And, we're, and they spend most, up to 50% of all of their energy, all of the energy that they're getting through the sun are going to feed these critters in the soil. And that, and you kind of have to ask yourself, you know, okay, well, actually, we'll jump on jumping ahead. So this is, this is what's going on in the soil. Knowing who all these critters are is really not that important. It's cool. I like it because when I look under this microscope and I get to, I make friends with these guys and I'll find a, a nematode and I'll follow them across my slide for five, 10 minutes. And I'll find an amoeba, amoeba and, and a protozoa and, and, or see some, some cell division and all sorts of really neat things under the microscope. But this is what's going on in a good soil. But this is not present in most of the soils in North America anymore and across the world. This is why um, and this, it's a slow death and it happens over, you know, a generation or two. And it's kind of why so many civilizations have fallen is that this slow death in the soil happens over time and you just don't notice it until it's all gone. And we end up with um, these deserts of no life. So we ask in all that life and all this life, who's the boss? And the boss is the plant. And this is what every gardener needs to know. The whole rhizosphere is controlled by the plants. The microorganisms that are present, the plant decides who it's going to feed. The plant is, knows which carbon compound it needs. And the plant isn't gonna be able to make, plants make hundreds of thousands of different carbon compounds and they receive millions of different carbon compounds from the soil and different nutrients. So a plant, which is missing, say, um, some molybdenum. It knows what type of organism, and in this case, it's gonna be fungal. It knows which type of fungus is likely to, to be able to mine molybdenum from some crystal rock of granite somewhere in the soil surface. And it's gonna put out a sugar. 
that's going to attract that particular type of mushroom, that particular hyphae, and it's going to form a, an, a rea um, either a, uh, an intercellular interaction or just on the outside of the root hair um, interaction with that particular type of fungus. Who's, and it's going to give that fungus some sugar because the fungus can't create sugar. They don't photosynthesize, but a plant photosynthesizes. But a plant can't mine molybdenum and selenium, but a fungus can. And so the plant creates the sugars that are going to feed the, the, the fungal life so that that fungus brings it the molybdenum, the selenium, the nitrogen, the phosphorus from the soil horizon that it's out mining. It's using the acids that, that are at the tip of a fungal hyphae. It burns into rock. It takes rock and breaks it down into, into its elements and transports it and feeds the plants. Plants can dedicate up to 50%, generally around 30% if it's a healthy plant, but some plants have to go up to 50% in, in areas that are maybe drier um, or not as, you know, as, as rich nutrients as here. And it's, so that's the interaction that it, it, it's making. It's pumping in sugars and amino acids and proteins and lipids. And that is what is happening under the soil. So the plant governs what's going on at the root tip. And it all, it, it, a lot of people are so concerned, say, about um, pH. Now, pH is important, but what's interesting is the only place that pH matters is in the micromillimeter at the tip of a root hair, and that the plant can generally control. So when we say blueberries like acidic soil, well, they do better in acidic soil, but they can take a relatively basic soil and they... In a, in a healthy system can attract the fungus, which is going to make it into an acidic soil. So that dumping on of lime and all these other things that we do to create pH isn't actually the best way to regulate pH. We might get into that in a little bit later. So why does the plant waste all that energy? Well, we just talked about why, because it that what's in the soil is what feeds the plant. It is taking most of its energy or up to most, or 30 to 50% of its energy, and just pumping it into the soil to feed the life that's there. And if it wasn't getting anything back, that would be a really poor survival strategy. But it's getting so much back. And that is why it does it. So let's take a look at some heroes and villains in the soil. Now, this was the work of Dr. Elaine Ingham. She was kind of the pioneer in this world of, of looking at all this life in the soil and saying, well, 20 years ago, people were saying, well, it it's, doesn't matter. It's just there. Life is there. It's not doing anything. And Elaine has, was kind of the, the pioneer in this world. And now the number of scientists studying soil is just so amazingly, it's growing daily um, in the amount of publications. I I can't, there's no way to keep up, but I, like I said, you learn something new every day. But Elaine made it as simple as it can be. And she noticed that there was a difference between a hero and a villain. The heroes exist in, in aerobic conditions, so where there's oxygen. The villains exist and thrive in anaerobic conditions. And now we're talking about our garden or pastures or forests. It's the opposite in a swamp situation. The heroes are actually anaerobic because they, that's great. It's a swampy situation. They need to exist in low oxygen environments. The, the, the line between aerobic and anaerobic is six parts per million, if anybody cares. But uh, uh, you need to make sure that your soil maintains over six parts per million oxygen to keep the heroes winning all the battles. And they do. Here is a ciliate. So when I look under the microscope and I see one of these, I and I've done this once, I had to throw one batch of compost tea out because I put too much bacterial food in it. The bacteria sucked up, even though I'm pumping 300 liters of oxygen, uh, I think it was a minute or I can't remember, 300 liters of oxygen an hour through that thing. I can't remember what the, what the, what the calculation was. The, the, um, 
the bacteria had consumed the oxygen so much in their reproduction that it got below six parts per million and the ciliates thrived. And I had to reduce the amount of bacterial food I was making in the next batch. Um, these are, uh, again, these are, um, oh, what type of fungus are they? Shoot, I've forgotten what type of fungus. What is a type of fungus? Again, um, oh, oh, sorry, umicytes. These are umicytes. And they have these little buds at the end. They're clear. If you notice when we looked at the dark um, uh, ladders of the good fungus, these are fungi like a, your, your um, mold bacteria, your, your powdery mildews are going to look like this under a microscope. They're clear. They're not segmented. Um, they're, they're branching in different areas. And so that's an umicyte and that's a bad guy. I don't want to see those when I look in my, under my microscope. And, but you're going to see them in anaerobic conditions. We did talk about there are some nematodes that are not really our friends and they are the root feeding nematodes. So here's a nematode going right into the root of, um, of a plant. And those are the ones that people are really worried about. But again, they survive mostly in an anaerobic situation. Here are our heroes. These are our aerobic heroes. And in an aerobic situation, these guys, the bacterial um, one, actually there's, there's um, a predatory nematode, which is just huge. I've only ever seen a couple of them and they take up the whole slide. Like they are enormous and they have, they're easy to identify by their size. And they also have this little tooth instead of little lips. And they use that tooth to go in and basically skewer a nematode and suck the life out of it. And um, those exist in aerobic situations and they kill these root feeding nematodes and they will win the battle. And these guys here, another really good happy thing. These were our bad guys as the ciliates. This is a flagellate. You see a long flagellate tail. They have one, two, sometimes three but they're nice and long. And these guys whip across the screen. Getting a shot of these guys is really hard because at this size, they'd be going like that. They, they just fly across your microscope. Um, but again, a sign of a, of a hero. And so these guys on the right-hand side survive in the aerobic situations. These are great for our plants. They are not disease vectors. They are just, they eat and be, are eaten and they provide health and nutrition and the um, they are our plant's um, uh, immune system. Uh, they feed the plant. They do absolutely everything. The superheroes of the soil are, in my mind, the fungi. The difference between a good soil and a great soil is fungal activity. Um, in a garden situation, you want to have a good amount of fungus. But the way we garden, by using especially the rototiller or turning our soil or flipping and eviscerating it, kills fungus dead. And we, in our garden soils, are gardening in highly bacterial soils, and we've killed most of the fungus by how we garden. Uh, and I say we by the majority of, of gardeners, the tradition of using a rototiller in the garden is such that it, it has this negative impact on the best friend in the garden, which is the mycorrhizal fungi. So there's several different kinds. I'm gonna well, concentrate just on these two because they're the, they're the most common. And there's the arbuscular mycorrhizal. This branch of fungus is actually inside of a cell. So this is the fungal hyphae. This is the cell wall. It's inside the cell. You cannot tell where a fungi begins and a, and a plant ends. The fungus is actually part of the plant and it's feeding and being fed by the plant inside the cell walls of the plant. The ectomycorrhizal work right on the outside of the plant. So these are the root, this is the root and this is the web of life that's on the outside. And again, that association is happening. That plant that plant might have a root system that's several meters long, but once it's an association with a fungus, that root system is now hundreds of meters long and, and probably much, much longer than that. So this understanding of bacteria, 
versus fun fungi or bacteria not versus bacteria and fungi are is the biggest distinction that we need to maintain in our minds of what type of soil we want to garden in when you have a fully bacterial soil so let's take it i'm going to stop for a second so this is called plant succession it's kind of the it's where soil so if you go back like eight four billion years ago you're going to find that their soil started here and over time you've got um, lichens that break down rock and associated with different bacteria. And then you got some basic soil with a lot of bacteria. And over time, we got some grasses that came in and over time, some bushes and over time, forests and over time, large forests and over time, great big old growth forests. And the difference between here in the fully bacterial soil to an old growth forest, which is nearly fully fungal, is just that the progression of and the increase of fungus over time in those soils and we're gardening about here we want a balanced amount of fungus in the soil where we generally garden is over here and the problem with that is this is weeds we spend all of our time fighting weeds in our soil because we have knocked it back from where we want it to be into where weeds thrive. And the reason why weeds thrive over here is because weeds are amazing plants. They survive based when there's very little nutrient availability, they can thrive in a soil that has very little nutrient, or very little cycling of carbon they are there to fix what we have broken and if you're if we're in a place where we're having way too much weed pressure is because we are sitting in a highly bacterial soil as we move across we find that our weeds dissipate and our fung we, uh, the fungal soils kill the kill off or, or outcompete the weeds or actually the weeds don't want to be there anymore the soil is too rich for them too so they not having they, they would produce too many sugars and they just it's it's kind of like the bloat in a in a in a goat that's getting on too good a grass it's not good for them and you can think of of for example a dandelion which is an amazing plant but a dandelion you never see it when you're walking in a forest it doesn't matter if that forest is has been you know there's been some deadfall and it's in the middle of a meadow but you don't see a dandelion in a forest you you only see a dandelion growing in a place where human beings have wrecked something again that dandelion there's there to fix things that we've broken but it's showing us that we're back in succession we're back in this area over here of highly bacterial soils and the difference between a bacterial soil and a fungal soil is right here, nitrogen versus ammonium. Uh, I was gonna go into this one, but this one's maybe a little too uh, advanced. We're gonna just skip over to, it's all about nitrogen. So plants consume nitrogen in two different forms. They consume it as ammonium and as nitrate. So NO3 and NH4. Weeds and, and all plants can consume both forms. Weeds do the best off of a nitrate situation. And um, our plants, our garden plants want a balance of both of these and forest systems want basically ammonium. Bacteria trade in nitrate, fungal trade in ammonium. And here again is that progression between the nitrates to the, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, bacteria through to fungus. The, it's the, it, the biggest characteristic is this balance between nitrogen and uh, nitrate and ammonium. And once we understand that when you have too many weeds is because you're working in a nitrate world. When you push that by not tilling it, by adding your carbon to the, your soil, you're getting more and more fungus, you're dropping, you're pulling out this new form of food for your plants, which is ammonium. And ammonium 
once your plants are in, a, in the proper balance between these two, but the cool thing about ammonium is you notice the hydrogen. Plants need hydrogen. One of the things that's amazing is once you get into these fungal worlds, you use a lot less water. One of the reasons for that is that the plant is getting its hydrogen from the ammonium. If you notice in nitrate, there's no hydrogen here. Plants have to then break down more water to get this hydrogen to build the amino acids and they use considerably more water in a nitrate world than in an ammonium world. So if your garden is sucking up tons and tons of water, it's because you're not providing it any hydrogen ions because you're giving it straight nitrate in this bacterial world. But as it progresses into a more fungal world, it's got another source of hydrogen other than water and ammonium to make its amino acids and make its proteins. So that is uh, one of the basic principles of why you need more fungal um, uh, networks in your soil. Uh, this is just, yeah, taking a look at, here's amino acids. So there's, when it's building amino acids, here's those, there's those hydrogens. It needs these hydrogens to build an amino acid and it doesn't get that from nitrate. So these hydrogens have to come from water. And in a water reduced environment, this could impede the growth of your plant. Okay, the, here it is, the big secret to a brilliant garden. So if you forget everything else I've said up to this point, here is all you need to remember. To have a big and brilliant garden, you need only carbon and life. That's it. If you're adding more carbon in all of its forms to your garden and adding life, you're gonna have a, a great garden. Um, everything from the, that nitrogen and nitrate balance to the bacteria and fungal balance, the plant is going to take care of all of that so long as you are adding carbon and life. So I sell compost tea and that's life, but it's not carbon. So if you're adding it onto a garden that has no carbon networks, you're adding all this life and it's just going out there to eat and thrive and feed your plants. But it's if you don't give it a food source, it's just going to go dormant or die. Or if you have carbon, but you've lived in this highly bacterial environment, the variety and the complexity of life isn't there. It will get there. Carbon attracts life. It just takes a long time to get there. But if you add both carbon and life to your soils and your gardens, that is the secret. Not adding fertilizers, not adding fungicides, not adding lime or any other micronutrient additions. Basically in most soils, and there are exceptions, but in most soils you do this, these two things and you are adding everything you need to your garden to survive, survive and thrive. So to wrap up, we'll look at the 10 basic principles to increasing the, the, the fertility and production in your, in your garden setting. And in fact, this works for my pastures and Jen's garden. And one is to look to and emulate natural systems. This is a permaculture basic building block. But when you look at the forest. One of the big mistakes that people often do is they take their compost and then they bury it deep underground. Well, a forest never does that. A forest takes that compost, that leaf litter, and it's on the top and it lets life take it down. It's got, it's got uh, red wriggler worms at the surface that's going to bring that down a few inches. Then you got your nightcrawler worms that are going to go back up and take it deep down into the ground. And but bring it into a place where it's not going to go anaerobic. So look at the, what nature is doing and, and emulate that. Nature has built the biggest, most verdant ecosystems on the planet without human beings. And we think, have this ego that thinks we can do it better than what nature has figured out over billions of years. Well, we can't. So when we are doing something the way nature does it, we're doing it right. If we're doing it where we want to play whack-a-mole, where we say, okay, um, the problem with this plant is a lack of nitrogen. So let's dump some nitrogen on. Okay, great. Now what did we do? We broke something else. 
whenever we do something and we see a problem and we fix it with our human, hey, here's our easy solution, that easy solution will inevitably break something else down the train. So when you add nitrogen on, you know what happens? All those complicated interactions that we talked about between fungus and soil, those go away because you're giving crack to your plants and they're like, woohoo, party. I don't need to make any associations. I don't need to waste this 30 to 50% of all my energy to feed the soil if I can get it for free. But the minute that you stop applying that nitrogen fertilizer, your plant goes, hey, hey, fungus, hey, bacteria, I need you guys again. But they're dead because the plant hasn't been feeding them over the last number of however long it took for that nitrogen to wash out of the soil and create a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Number two, we talked about add carbon, add leaf litter, add compost, add wood chips, add carbon in all of its forms. The nature is going to find the balance. Nature, carbon is your sponge, carbon is your house, it is your restaurant, it's your supermarket for all the life in the soil. Carbon is that bread basket and the house and the carries oxygen and the holder of water. It is absolutely everything. If you don't have a high carbon um, percentage in your soil, you're not going to have healthy life in your soil. Three, add life. Once you add the, and it's add that variety of life. It, when you looked, we looked at that slide, we saw about six or seven, I could tell six or seven different types of bacteria. That's great. You actually want about 10,000 different types of bacteria in your soil and probably more than that. And, and so many more different types of fungus. And the, the more complex, every one of those bacteria does something different, provides some different micronutrient, some different enzyme, some different amino acid. So the more and varied the life is in your soil, that better and healthier your soil is going to be. So when I make a compost tea, for example, I take life from my farm. I go out into the forest. I take a handful out there. I take my newest compost pile. I take my oldest compost pile. I take something from the sheep barn. I take something from the goat barn. And we're bringing all of that together to create this complex life that some of that isn't going to find a niche where it ends up, but some of it is. And the more variety of life that you have, the more likely you're going to find something to fit into the niche that's in your particular garden and growing system. Um, plants cooperate more than they compete. So we spend so much time killing things that want to live and trying to make things live that want to die. And we're forgetting that we're killing a lot of things that are doing good to our soil. So before you pull every single weed out, remember that that plant is feeding that soil. 30 to 50% of the energy of that, of that weed, that what I prefer to call a pioneer plant, is feeding something in your soil, which is going to feed your plant. Now, there are things that are, you know, if you have a rhizominous clog of grass growing into your cucumber plants, well, that's not going to work. But you know what? You can grow a lot of things through chickweed and dandelion has got a tape root. So it's not going to compete with a lot of your plants. It may not look as pretty and it may not put you on the front cover of good homes and gardening, but your those plants are still feeding that soil and they're feeding that soil with that, again, that diversity of life. It's doing something that that chickweed is doing something to your soil that your tomato plant isn't going to be able to do. And so that variety and that complexity of life is super important and understand that that chickweed is probably helping your tomato plant. Keep it covered. This is a this is something that I've struggled with because and, and it, it's it's keeping things covered all year. So when you think about how much energy plants are 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 consecrating to putting energy into the soil, yet we leave our plants and we, we rip out everything at the end of the year and leave it barren for the next six months. So looking into cover crops and the techniques around cover crops so that your soil is growing every minute of the year is super important. There's a lot of amazing videos online, but Look and put yourself as a goal to find some aspect of your garden that if you've left it barren last year, 
to not do it this year, to experiment with a cover crop. Start with one bed this year if you haven't done it. Go and go to two beds next year and make it your goal to grow all year round with different cover crops and make sure that you never leave soil uncovered. Now you can cover with mulch. The mulch is still an energy boost and it's gonna feed the life in your soil, but it's not gonna be making the complex sugars that photosynthetic activity is going to be able to do. So it's a huge step forward. It's never leave it naked. You can put a mulch on, that's great. A tarp is better than nothing, but still you're gonna, you're not adding to the soil. You're, it's more of the difference between sustainable and regenerative. A, toil, a tarp might be sustainable. It's keeping the soil where it's at. It's not leaching out and it's not compacting, but it's not making it better. So keep your soil covered. Keep it diverse. And we've talked about this before, but every plant does something different than the next plant. Every bacteria does something that another bacteria can't do. So the more diversity of life, the more complex your system is, the happier your soils are going to be. Native prairies used to have a, a hundred different species of grass growing in a square meter. Today, we do one or two species. In a good cover crop, we look at four or five. A fantastic cover crop, we might be up to 12 different species. But we know that the soil is used to growing hundreds of different species. And so we need to remember that that's the way Mother Nature do is, did it. And look back to principle number one, keep it diverse, keep everything diverse. Don't plant the same plant in the same place year after year after year. You can get away with that by adding carbon in life. But if you are rotating things through and planting, interplanting different species, you're gonna be better off. Aim to keep it rough and loose. So this talks when you take your soil, bring it up in your hand and give it a squeeze. And if it, it should hold together and then take your other hand and just kind of ruffle it and it should fall apart, but not like sand. It should fall apart in nice little aggregated pieces. And that is rough and loose. It's loose because it falls apart, but it's still not like sand. It's not smooth and falling through your fingers. It's got clumps. That's the, that's the bacterial glues and the fungal hyphae holding it together and the carbon structures that are there. That's what's meant by rough and loose. Let mother nature be your rototiller. Let the worms do the work. Let the worms go in and put the worm castings at the top of the soil. Let them bring the carbon that you've put on the top and bring it down and keep things moving and loose, loosening them up. Don't rototill. You're knocking your soil so far back in succession that you are just making it good for weeds and not for the plants. You're doing it in a nitrate environment, not in a nitrate ammonium balance, not a bacterial fungal balance. You're knocking it back and it takes time for it to fix itself. So let mother nature do that work. Don't use a rototiller. Let mother nature be your pest control. So when you have a healthy soil, your plants don't put out the hormones that say they're in trouble, the pheromones that say that they're in trouble. Your plants have the immune system to fight off all the problems. When you have a healthy soil, fungicides and pesticides are moot. They're not required. Nobody has to spray a fungicide on an old growth forest because it's protected itself. It has the life in the soil, which is acting to protect that, that uh, ecosystem. Mother Nature is going to do a way better job than we are. Because every time, again, that we play that game of whack-a-mole, where we see a problem and we take something and we hit that mole, well, we know that we're causing a problem somewhere else. And we don't know what that problem is. And then we, we figure out, oh, there's this other problem. Okay, well, here's another chemical solution to that. And we hit that, but then two other moles pop out. And crop after crop that we do, like right now, cotton, for example, is sprayed, I think, 11 times with 11 different chemicals. And it all started by adding nitrogen, which broke something, which broke something, which broke something, which broke something. And now there's 11 different chemicals that have to be sprayed on that crop to get it through to its harvest. And Mother Nature provides you with all the nutrients that you need. Soil tests are something that people spend a lot of money on. And... I remember my mom uh, at the at the cabin in on the Shushwap 
she was complaining that her garden had nu no nutrients in it. And I said, well, mom, take a look, where is your garden? And it was right in the middle of this beautiful cedar forest. And I said, mom, does, do you think this, these huge trees are gonna grow in a, for, in, a, in a place where there's no nutrients? And the fact is that everything is there problem she had is that never plant a garden in a cedar forest but that's the the roots of cedar are amazing and they're just going to choke everything up but um the nutrients were there but if you took a soil test the soil test is going to come back oh there's nothing there but if there's nothing there where why are all these trees thriving the fact is that all, all the nutrients are there they're just not in a water soluble medium they're not just oh here we'll add some water and they're going to they're going to be able to be sucked up into that plant. All those nutrients are there, but they're in the cytoplasm and the protoplasm of different cilia or amoeba and bacteria and fungus. And the fungus is going to be able to mine that selenium out of that grain of sand. And that is where Mother Nature is going to provide you with everything. Elaine Ingo says, all but a silicate uh, hand, a sand has got every micronutrient that your plant needs to grow. But you need to have the life that knows how to get it. And then you need the life that knows how to eat that thing that knows how to get it. And then, then, and the plant needs to know how to attract that particular form of life through whatever sugar in its root system to be able to feed itself with that particular um, nutrient or amino acid or protein. That is the basic principles. And so that was the, the end of the presentation for today. So I am happy to take any questions if Great. there are any. Thank you so much, Mark. That, that was so thought provoking and, and stimulating. And we do have a list of questions. I will run by you right now, starting with a question from Jacqueline. She says, I'm starting new veg beds, raised beds, and we'll be purchasing a garden blend bulk soil from a local supplier to fill them. She wants to know, would you recommend any amendments before she plants seeds or transplants into the new beds? How do you suggest she proceed once she has this new soil. Okay, so your new soil is is going to be a highly disturbed soil. So it's it's been built and moved and turned and and it's going to be it's going to be it's going to provide a really good garden. Generally, if they've done it right, it'll do a really nice, lovely garden for a year or two. What you need to keep in mind is not to mine your garden soil, but to build your soil. So um, this is where adding, make sure you're adding that carbon and keeping those, the, the, the roots and the plants building soil over time and, and bringing things in to attract your fungi. There's not gonna be any fungal activity in that soil, but as it sits there and it becomes part of that, that ecosystem where you put it, it will attract the, those different forms of life. So in terms of amendments, I would I think you're going to find that your garden generally grows pretty well for a year or two in those soils. But if you just don't do anything, you are going to mine that soil. And by year three, you don't have a very productive soil anymore. So this is where um, making sure you're using mulches and make sure you're using cover crops and make sure that you're adding compost and compost teas um, to, to those soils. Um, there is a rule about fertilizer and the science goes that if you're using anything more than a 6% fertilizer, so organic fertilizers are usually like, you know, 333, 444, 555, 666, but never more than that. Um, you're not going to kill the life in their soil. But once you go past that 6%, once you use those, those lawn fertilizers or, or your tomato fertilizer, your, your what's that, Nutri-Gold or whatever, that blue stuff that people pour, I can't remember what those are called. Um, those are actually going into your soil. They're feeding your soil drugs. 
your, your sorry, your plant basically sugar candy. And that is in effect killing all the complex interactions that are in your soil. Um, so basically it goes back to that slide. There, there's two solutions to every problem in gardening, add soil, uh, add carbon and add life. So you're saying um, compost, all of us are probably already making some kind of compost. So use compost, compost tea. And if people would like to try yours, they can reach out to you. Um, keeping things mulched, I imagine, even if it's just with the grass clippings uh, from the rest of the yard or dried leaves or especially leaf, leaf mulch, you know. Um, so did I, hopefully that answered, answered your question, Jacqueline. Uh, if not, you can unmute or write something in the chat box. Then we have a question from Mark with a K, Mark with a C. Uh, Mark says, is it okay to turn garden beds with a garden fork? I like to look for wire worms, et cetera. And then I'm sure we know how, uh, or not how, but that he's going to dispatch them from there. Um, I've been doing the same thing, but I'm just using my hand. I'm not actually turning with the fork. What do you suggest, Mark Dahl? What I, what I use, I use, so for example, when I, I don't know if I didn't, did I put that picture in? Um, uh, I don't, again, principle of turning your soil, if you're turning it with the fork, I think that's, so picture soil like a, like a forest canopy. You have some birds that are at the top. You got you some warblers that are like this thing, and you got the red, the yellow rump warblers that are only at the bottom. But then you've got the robins that exist here, and you've got your eagles at the top. But you don't ever get them in different. They don't mix up at different levels. So what you're doing when you're either when you're disturbing the soil too much is you're taking that tree and you're turning it upside down, and you're expecting the eagle to be happy on the lowest branch. So it's a basic principle. So it, what I would, what I do is I use a broad fork, which is about this wide and it has four times and I jump on it and it goes down into the soil and, it, and I push it back and it just cuts through the soil like this. Um, so it, all the different soil horizons don't get intermixed. They get aerated because air is essential. And we talked about an aerobic system so in gardens that I, and I don't do this with all, I do this with, you know, uh, a, a already disturbed uh, system like potatoes. I do disturb my soil with potatoes, but I just spent two days digging up the gort barn to put four inches of compost on top of them, right? So it's, but I broad forked that whole system instead of turning it. Back when I was a kid, my job was to go out there with a shovel and spade and flip over the entire potato bed before we went and planted and then rake it. And then we'd plant potatoes. Um, don't do that anymore. It's a hard habit to break, isn't it? I mean, we, we've all been raised in this culture of turning the soil and um, so many people, especially men, say it just doesn't feel like I'm gardening without turning the soil. But you're talking about just keep layering, but keep putting layers on. And, and I've been doing that for, oh gosh, at least the last 15 years. And I'm absolutely amazed at the difference of the health in my soil, the health of my plants but I do need to buy a broad fork. Thank you for reminding me. And if my husband Lee is still here, honey, that's what I want for my next whatever present you're gonna get me is a broad fork. Um, you got it. You oh, got it. it. <laughs> Lee, how's your one? So I'm really I am so also good. just Lee. using my hands more and more um, because why are worms don't seem to go that deeply. They, they tend to be the first four inches or so. And so I, I, I've just been using my hands, but you know, I'm, I'm quite a primitive at heart. It doesn't bother me. And my, my fingernails prove that my hands are my best tool now. 
Mark, we have a question from Marlene. She wants you to expand on the pre on the question of um, sowing a cover crop in the fall. How do you plant the bed in the spring if you're not tilling the crop under? Okay, so there are lots of different techniques <clears throat> based on this. So the easiest one is if you have a bed, so you plant an entire bed with things that are going to end early in the se season. Like say you've got your I don't know, your peas that are tapping out by the end of January or something like that. So then you can plant a, a crop like buckwheat. Now it's a one, it's a monoculture, it's not the best thing, but it'll grow really well, but it gets winter killed. And it goes to the ground, creates a dead layer, and you just plant right into it. If you want to use other, there are other cover crops that the, that are, and this is, you want to research which ones that you use, but will be killed by crimping. So in a, if you're doing like a four foot bed and you get a, like a fall rye mix will crimp. And so as you stand it, what you do is you take a board, like a two by six, and then you put a, a two by two underneath it, put a rope on each end. So now it's like a swing where you're holding the rope, but the swing is under your foot and you push that into the crop and you jump on it. And that knocks the crop down and that little strip on the bottom crimps the, um, the stalk and that kills the plant. And then again, you plant into it. You can grow it and then tarp it. So it's called occultation. So you get a black tarp, a tarp where no sunlight's coming through. So you flatten it down, throw a tarp over it and that's gonna take two to three weeks. So you need to you know, plan your, your, your time and that'll kill your, your cover crop. And then you can plant into it. You can mow it. So you can take a mower, put it, or, or a weed whacker, mow it right down, wait two days, mow it again and plant into that. You're still gonna get some regrowth. So this is why I say like, start, go on the YouTube, find, a, find somebody's system that speaks to you. There are hundreds of systems out there try if you've never done it try one bed this year then i th think you're going to find if you're going to do it on by in a few years you're going to do it to your whole garden because the benefits of year-round photosynthetic activity is enormous um, it's soil doesn't want to be naked Na nature abhors a vacuum Thank you, Mark. Uh, Dan Jason from Salt Springs Seeds has a, a great uh, selection of cover crop seeds. And he also has a really good place on his website, that's saltspringseeds.com, where he explains a lot of these things that Mark was just talking about. I've never heard of crimping before, Mark. I'm really curious about trying that. Yeah, it came out of... I believe the origin story of that it was just a farmer was realizing that wherever he drove his tractor, all the, the plant, that rye plant died. And it kind of just came out of that. Now there's, it's used, it's, a, it's the biggest one for broad scale because they have what are called roller crimpers. So there are these things that are like eight, 12 feet across that are rollers that have that crimping action and they just crimp the stalks as they go. So that's what's used by a lot of the regenerative farmers on the broad scale, on the broad acre. Mm -hmm. Well, I've already planted quite a lot of buckwheat and flax. I just bought it from the health food store because we eat buckwheat and we eat flax. Um, and you know, it's already up a good four inches. And I, I, I cut it once it's about six inches and it grows again, but I do a lot of chop and drop with with that kind of thing. And you've brought up chickweed a few times. I love chickweed as a cover crop. It really makes a great chop and drop and I can plant transplants around it. Planting seeds in a cover crop, I've not been very successful with, but planting you know, transplants that are four, six, eight inches, you know, that are well-established seem to do really well. So um, Morag Gamble also has some good information on, on cover cropping. I'm really glad that you, that you brought that up. Uh, Pat Johnston is saying, 
Well, she's asking what cover crop do you use? I've been using winter, I think she means rye, but it's very hard to kill off now in spring. Uh, any more words of advice for Pat? Well, <clears throat> cover crops are, you know, are, are just, the science on it is, is kind of new. And so there, there's, people are experimenting with different ones. What I recommend is just, again, looking to nature. And I would say, make sure that you have a brassica, a legume, and, a, and well, the one that's difficult is, well, an early, an early grass. So if you have the legume, the grass, the brassica, you have kind of fit a lot of different niches are falling into that. But um, like Gabe Brown, if you've never heard of Gabe Brown, so Gabe Brown is a broad scale farmer who is the king of cover crops. And on his systems, he's running cover crops like 12, 15, 20 different species. And that's that principle of just that diversity of life. And he's, he is a strong proponent of more is better. The more- Is that the, Gabe? Did you Gabe, say Gabe? G-A-B-E? Brown. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So when you're, when you're saying a brassica, a pea and a grass, so something like a radish and a vetch and mm -hmm. a rye, rye something like that. Yep. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Jacqueline's just thanking you for the advice you gave her about her new garden beds. And she's saying, I can add shredded big leaf maple leaves from last fall to start with, that sounds great. I can also add some composted bark. I always use organic fertilizers, all numbers below 10. And after the season, I'll keep the soil covered with the year's debris and tarp it during heavy rains. I'm gonna follow your advice. That's from Jacqueline. Thanks, Jacqueline. That's really nice. Uh, Nance is saying, I found something on YouTube yesterday on worm towers, um, like putting a worm compost system in the raised planter beds. I'm wondering if this is a good system. Or is it better to keep the worms inside uh, the compost for the worm tea compost tea making? Did I make so sense out of that? I, I got it. You can't go like worms everywhere. Just you know, you know what's now. I know I'm not sure here, but I know in the interior of British Columbia, worms are an introduced species. So people are going to take, but they're there now. Um, it might be the end of the birch tree and the other things, but um, I'm looking at that worm tower because my, my field, because it floods, um, basically the water table is the level, layer of the grass for six months of the year. I end up in, there's a whole nother level of science of oxidation and reduction of soils. Um, I have an incredibly reduced soil and that chases the worms away. So that idea of worm towers, I'm contemplating how I can introduce that into my broad systems so that when the water goes away, the worms are already there to decompact the soil that's being brought on by the compaction of all that water over the winter. So yeah, I think that's a brilliant idea. In incorporate worms right. wherever you can. You know, in our garden, we have a pile of rocks to incorporate snakes, right? So we pile all of our rocks, so the snakes go in there and tarps. Throw some, if you want to attract some snakes, throw a dark tarp down somewhere and just leave it there. And then you'll pull it up at the end of the year and you're gonna have 50 snake skins underneath it. That's right. right. Well, I also find even putting some uh, layers of uh, non-glossy newspaper on the ground, the worms start to come for that and start working their magic underneath. I'm a big fan of alfalfa, organic alfalfa pellets. I just throw a handful around and it seems to really attract the worms as well. Um, so yeah, I love that, that worms, worms, however you can get them. And, and I like to say, if you feed them, they will come. So, and also if you, if you give them cover, they'll, they, they're a lot happier. 
Uh, Judy is asking a question about cedar shavings. She's never used them in the veggie garden because she thought they were too acid. Is that true? What are your thoughts on cedar shavings, Connor? Well, the, 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 the question people always had around cedar, cedar is it, it has an antipathy to, or, uh, that's not the right word. I, anyways, I, uh, allopathy. So, so it's, it's, it, the old cedar, when we, you cut down an old cedar and it, or an old cedar falls to the ground, you come back a hundred years from now and it's still there because it's got all these antifungal components to it and people are, and you don't want to put an, uh, an, any fungicides into your garden. New cedar, because it's all, old cedars used to grow up, they'd be a hundred years old before they ever saw sunlight. Um, and in that, so they were a slow growing tree. Now our cedars that the ones that are going to survive the climatic changes, which seem to be very fewer and fewer, are, are second cut cedars and they're growing in these, they had sunlight since day one. And you, one of those trees falls down and it rots as well as any other tree. So the, it wasn't about the acidity of the tree, it was about its ability to repel bacteria and fungus and the decomposers. And you want those decomposers in your soil. Um, I wouldn't be afraid to use it now because Good. that- well, I have never heard anybody explain it like that. That makes so much sense to me because I do use um, cedar chips because I can get them easily and freely. I only use them in my beds, but after three years, I can actually dig up that amended soil and use it in my garden beds and the plants and the soil just love it. But I had never heard an explanation like that. Thank you, Mark. Jacqueline is asking about liming garden soil. She uses dolomite. What's your advice on that? It is, I mean, it, 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 it works, but um, it's one of those things. It works, but it works, but it washes away. It works, but you're not letting nature create the conditions that it needs. And it works, but it, if you do it, you have to keep on doing it. Um, so it's not, again, nature can fix most things, but there are some systems that are, you know, so heavily reduced and are constantly reduced that that pH is beyond what the plant can control. So the plant can swing pH at the root tip by at least two, you know, from a four to a six or from a six to an eight. But if you're getting outside of that, that's getting to a place where the plant just doesn't want to grow there. So either you decide, I'm going to grow something here that wants to live, um, or you want to create something that doesn't exist there. So if you're looking to grow something that really needs a eight um, pH um, and you have a four, well, maybe think about what you're planting instead of trying to create a four or, or vice oh. versa. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, thank you for that, Mark. James is suggesting oyster shell flour instead of lime to stabilize pH and the microbes like it. Uh, Denise is just saying she plants her veggies on berms uh, to help with weeding she, and trying to kill off a cover crop has been very challenging. Uh, and Mark's given us suggestions on that already, Denise. And that is it for our questions. I will say that I have never limed my garden um, and I grow everything from asparagus and figs to blueberries. So everything that likes a pH range from 4.5 up to seven, uh, or I should say the other way around, lower is the higher number. So anyway, just for anyone who um, questions, Mark's advice, I totally agree with him that it's possible to grow without lime, but I do make a lot of compost and I use a lot of compost and I call compost the great equalizer. It just seems like what Mark is saying about feeding, feeding soil carbon and microbes, what the microbes like, feeding life is 
is the answer to everything. Mark, I'm just going to have a few announcements and then I'm going to ask you to give us. Yeah. Just the one line I forgot I wanted to say is just compost. I, I implied it, but I didn't say it. Compost is not, is not carbon. Compost is mostly life. And that's when I say add life, that's when you look at carbon or compost, you're not adding, oh, this is about adding carbon to my soil. It isn't, it isn't, because that carbon, that, that it's, it's life with its, with its life support system, because that carbon, that, that compost is going to disappear. So compost is actually adding life, and that's, if it's done right. That was the one thing I forgot to actually explicitly say. Thank you for clarifying that. I, I did pick that up from today and also many other times that I've, I've gabbed with you. So thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, tomorrow at 11.30 is the Gabbing About Gardening radio show. That's on 89.5 FM, Cortez Radio. That's live from 11.30 to 12.30. If you miss it, just click on the link that's available at cortezradio.ca and you can hear the show uh, and all of the past shows so far. Mark, this has been recorded and I'm sure people are gonna want to listen again. There's so much wonderful information. This will be available in probably about an hour or two. I'll post it on Facebook and it will also go on our Gabbing About Gardening YouTube channel. So check it out there. If you can't find it, just send me an email or a Facebook message and I will send you the link. A reminder that we are freely giving this information. Mark, thank you so much for this. And that through the gift economy, you have an opportunity to give back uh, to Mark for his time and his expertise and his fabulous presentation today. Uh, next week, we have, oops, I'm not prepared here. Let me just find who we have. Next week is um, Aaron Stevens. Aaron is going to be giving us a live tour of his garden. Aaron is the co-founder, owner, <laughs> of Nature's Path, the organic cereal company. He's been an organic gardener, I think since he was five years old and he's got some great stories he's gonna share with us. That's next week on Gabbing About Gardening, same time, same place. Mark, I always like to let our guests have the final word as we go out. What would you, what would you like to share with us as a, a tip I see here that you're selling compost tea next Saturday at the farm. Yay! And people can reach you through Facebook, uh, direct messaging. And any other final words of advice for us? No, I think uh, we covered everything. And thanks, Lou. That was that was great. Thank you for all you're doing for the gardening community. Well, thank you, Mark. I just love having you in the community. Um, and one reminder that I know goes along with everything that Mark is saying, uh, and that is we don't need to pull up the dead plants in our gardens, the lettuces, the peas, the beans. We don't need to pull up their roots. As Mark was saying, they continue to feed the soil. It's a different story with brassicas and tomatoes and potatoes, anything that can uh, lead to disease but is that what you're doing now is that a new it's, it feels like something new we didn't grow up with with being told just cut your plants and leave the roots in the soil what's your thought on that mark well, and then we'll say bye bye I, my mom's garden we ripped everything out and made the big piles and they all ended up in the compost pile but yeah it was naked and um you know i say jen's garden because i i do soil but she does the gardening and you look outside and it's, you know, a lot of beds haven't been planted yet this year, but there's still lots of things growing in them from last year that were not pulled up. Yep. And all those roots that, that feed, feed the soil throughout the winter time. 
Well, thank you, Mark. It's It's been a delight. Thank you, everyone, for joining Gabbing About Gardening. We will see you next week. Same time, same place. Now go outside and get dirty. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mark. I really enjoyed that. That was great. It was wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next time.